All right. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to club meeting for October. Just share my intro slide here. Uh, can you mute yourself if you're if you're not talking? Thanks. All right. So. Um, Got a couple of updates. We got our regular uh, club business. Uh, we also want to uh, just touch on the contest prizes for last month because we were we were unsure last month what the actual prizes were. The prizes, so we got those confirmed. And then the main topic for for this month, Chris Huber is going to give us an overview of the club repeater. Uh, so let me just cover the uh, the homebrew contest update first. Uh, so if you missed the meeting last month or if you attended, uh, first prize, we had Bob Mix and his Diddy Tuner 2. Um, Bob waved his prize. Um, for the second prize, we had two joint winners, Ken and Dave, both with their presentations on their, their battery box projects. And they're both going to get $20 each. Um, so you guys will get a check coming in the mail soon. Um, so we just want to give a quick update on what the prizes were because we weren't able to confirm for last month. So congratulations again for our three winners for our homebrew contest last month. All right. Uh, so that was that. Uh, Jojo, are you able to give an update on treasury and membership? Uh, yes, Kevin, except that my computer is updating and uh, it's taking a while, maybe five more minutes. If you can pull up my... Uh... Yeah. Word or PDF document, please, and I can present. I can do that. Yeah, hold on. Let me see. One minute. Sorry about that. This is Sorry. still updating. <laughs> yeah, downloaded it. Hold on. You've all been there. <laughs> are we waiting? Do we have any news on a potential return to uh, in person meeting? Not at the, the meeting site that we've used before because that, that facility, the, um, the organization that runs that facility, they, they don't have plans to return themselves in person. So they're just not open right now. So we, we were thinking, the board was thinking of looking at like small alternate places maybe, but that location that we've used in the past is, just isn't available for us right now. Yeah, it's a video, it's a good location. Yeah. Right. Can you see, Jojo? Oops. Jojo, can you see? Okay, I unmuted myself. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Jojo KN6HTD, the treasurer and membership chair of River City Arts, and I am presenting the report for this month of October. As of right now, we have uh, 150 members, and uh, the number is always going up <laughs> every two weeks. We have uh, 10 members who are paid for the 2022 uh, end of the year good for end of the year and we have 96 ARRL members that's uh, about 61 percent of our total membership and with regards to membership uh, membership dues for 2022 can be paid by PayPal online or check mail to the treasurer I'm expecting one check from uh, a new uh, member so I will update it for the next meeting. 
And um, more importantly, please consider joining ARRL to ensure that our frequency band plans remain in place or improve. You also get tons of educational material every time with the ARRL magazines. So that is a personal um, endorsement and I'm with ARRL as most of us are. Uh, we definitely recommend it. A second, I will discuss about our income and our latest bank balance is uh, 8,394 and 47 cents. Uh, we keep our money at Safe Credit Union and uh, we have a pending deposit from our recent membership payments of 176.90. So that's uh, the most recent uh, membership payments uh, I received through PayPal, mostly. And Kevin just mentioned that we are awarding uh, three winners uh, with, uh, was it 40, 20, and 20 dollars? Uh, 20 and 20. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Bob chose not to accept the... Uh... Oh, okay. Thank you for clarifying. So just two $20 awards. And I will issue that. Uh, can you scroll up, please? Okay, and that's it for the uh, financial statement. Uh, our bank record and the uh, books uh, match up pretty good. Oh, the number one item, I think uh, we overshoot the slide. Oh, sorry. Okay, it's a, uh, an invitation for all our members or some of you who are enthusiastic enough to participate in the leadership to join our River City Arts Board and maybe be interested in uh, being one of the officers. So let us know. Number two, uh, consider training for net control operator during the two meter, 10 meter and SSTV nets. So, Thank you, uh, Wilson. He's the most recent uh, addition to the two meter net, but he's been doing really great job doing the SSTV net, nets. Uh, third, we invite you to come to Pacificon and that's coming up uh, in less than 10 days time. Uh, uh, ARRL booth, uh, I mean, I will be there for ARRL as well as Carol is. And uh, I don't know who's coming, but let us know who's coming so we can meet each other there and maybe have some fun. And uh, that's it. Can you scroll up one Oops, sorry. additional? Thank you. Okay, the last ham fest that we attended uh, was the West Placer Lincoln Hamfest. And those are a few pictures that I took uh, from our ARRL booth. Carol and I uh, were there. Uh, we have a sign up that happened. On the right side, there's Naresh. Uh, I don't know if he's a member of our club, but he's the next presenter in our general club meeting. He'll talk about DMR. I've been in touch with him recently. And in fact, we're going to have a pre-meeting this Sunday because we need to set up some DMR stuff before the general membership presentation. And of course, you will see other members and board uh, officers. There's Phil, there's Neil, and there's Bob. And on the lower right hand is the CW King of the Sacramento Valley. <laughs> That's Mike uh, with the Samuel F. Morse am uh, Amateur Radio Club. So he holds classes for CW for those who are interested and uh, I encourage you to join. The number five, the recent radio sporting event uh, that happened this weekend was the California QSO party. And I don't know who among you participated, but... Uh, it should be fun. 
And last but not the least, the recent Newham progressing very well on the air is James Goldstein, KN6QNJ. So congratulations for being on the air uh, in the nets. I, hear, I heard him and uh, he's, been, he's been asking a lot of questions on progressing into his amateur radio journey. So thanks for joining the club and thanks for your enthusiasm. Uh, can you move up a little more, please? And that is it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Jojo, can 6 hdd Back to you, Kevin. All right, thanks, Jojo. All right. Uh, Carol, be able to give us an update on the club website and social media? Uh, sure, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Uh, I have a couple of, first of all, very good evening. Uh, I'm Carol, KP4MD uh, webmaster here for River City Arcs, as well as um, your ARL Sacramento Valley section manager. And uh, here we go, a couple of announcements. <clears throat> First of all, um, if you are um, an intrepid uh, ham fest uh, seeker, uh, after having the Lincoln Ham Fest last month and this past weekend, there was the Valley of the Moon Ham Fest over there in Sonoma. And we have another one coming up this weekend. If you want to go up to Reading, I actually will be there uh, working the ARRL um, uh, booth. And this will be at Bentronics uh, there on 141 Locust Street in Reading. And that starts at 8 a.m. on Saturday, the 9th of October. So you can get your full of that and uh, then hit uh, Pacific Con the following week. So <laughs> um, plenty to, to go to. There is a request. This is a request email that uh, we received uh, a few days ago. And this is from a uh, Cubs, Cub, uh, Cub master uh, for PAC 107 in Fair Oaks. And they're looking for a volunteer uh, ham operator who would be willing to set up uh, a station for two hours, uh, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. on October 16th to allow Cub Scouts and Weebelow Scouts to participate in the Jamboree on the Air. Now, the, the uh, annual Scouting Jamboree on the Air is where, uh, wow, there's uh, many, many thousands of Scouts get on the air all around the world and try to speak with each other. Uh, some do it on HF, some do it on uh, uh, VHF through uh, different, uh, I guess they use digital modes where they can tunnel and come out in different repeaters. And uh, it's a great experience for these youngsters to be able to talk on a microphone and, and get some exposure to amateur radio. Uh, this happens to be the same exact weekend as Pacific Con. Uh, so some of us won't be around, but if you're interested in volunteering for this, please let us know. Otherwise uh, we'll have to pass this on. Um, to some, uh, so, some other clubs that might have some resources or somebody could be, uh, be able to help them out. Uh, they're only requesting two hours of time to let uh, youngsters talk on your microphone there. And if you're interested in participating, drop, uh, drop us off uh, an email, contact at n6na.org. Uh, now we're gonna go over to the analytics. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing and then reshare. Okay, this is the um, website uh, activity report for September, 2021. Now I do wanna um, uh, state that the, uh, our website is actually frozen in a, uh, it, it's not being updated uh, for the past few weeks. And the reason for that is there was a major uh, overhaul at uh, Google Sites, which uh, hosts our site. And uh, so they're, uh, uh, requiring us to uh, transfer our whole website over to a new format that's more compatible with mobile devices. Uh, and uh, we're in the process of doing that conversion. Uh, we don't, it's not exactly ready to do, to, to switch over yet. If we do it before it's completely ready, it'll disable the uh, PayPal buttons for your, for uh, your membership dues. 
So as soon as we have that done, we will activate uh, the, uh, the new format. You won't have to change anything at all. It's gonna be the same URL, which is n6na.org. And that will be very, very shortly. But um, all the information in there is still good. The, the calendar is still good. It's just some of the details on uh, on the front page would be uh, not changed since uh, a few weeks ago. A reminder that our nets are Wednesday nights. So tomorrow night at 8 p.m. our two meter net will meet on 145.25 megahertz. Uh, you can uh, also get into the net uh, by Echolink or All Star. I was really happy to be able to do that. Uh, couple of weeks ago when I was on the East Coast and check in on Echo Link to our net. That was quite exciting. I was uh, over in Virginia uh, and uh, coming loud and clear. The uh, 10 meter net follows on, at 830 on 28.420 megahertz upper sideband. Everyone is welcome to check in on there. And again, all licensed classes have access to that frequency. So uh, please join us there. Uh, nine o'clock is a slow scan TV net on the 441.30 megahertz repeater, which is also uh, streaming uh, on YouTube live. And uh, congratulations also to Wilson N6 EMF, who has done a wonderful job serving as net control and also doing the YouTube live streaming. So he's doing very well with that. I appreciate that. Um, DIY radio page will continue on our website as well as a swap page. And this is one of the pages we have not been able to update uh, in the past few weeks, but we will do that very soon as soon as we do the conversion of this of our website. Uh, website activity for September, total page views increased uh, from uh, 1740 in August up to 2506 in September. And the peak web page views were 121. That was September 8th, which was the day after our last uh, monthly meeting, uh, people were going there to look, I'm sure, for the uh, link to the um, uh, to the meeting video, which was the home brew night. And uh, the most active pages uh, during September, 10 meters seems to have a lot of activity, a lot of interest. And I think that has to do with the upswing in uh, solar flux and solar activity. We've been having solar flux indexes uh, in the triple digits. Uh, for the past uh, few weeks, we've been having some really good propagation and uh, 10 meters is showing some DX uh, contacts during the daylight hours. So um, it's uh, getting a lot of activity. Homepage also 552 views. The Magnetic Loop project page always is popular, 150 uh, views. Then the all-star page and then our repeater page also. Uh, as far as sources, 51.8% uh, uh, of the views were uh, directed by Google. Uh, and uh, we had about 34.8% were direct hits to our uh, n6na.org URL. And most of the views again were from California. Uh, second place was Texas. Virginia was third place with 77 views. And then the rest of uh, the states and the countries that you see on the map here that are uh, colored in blue were uh, from visits uh, to our website. Social media, uh, we had uh, 852 views of videos on our YouTube channel last month. Uh, and we now have 338 subscribers. Uh, we have 543 followers on our Facebook page. That's increasing as well as our Twitter page, 100, 144 followers. And we do have still our Discord server uh, for our members. Again, uh, if you need any information uh, from uh, any of the club officers or the board members, uh, remember to send an email to us, contact at n6na.org and it will be directed to the uh, appropriate person. Uh, as far as a board uh, member, yes, we are going to be due for elections in November. So that's why we're looking for people who are interested to be nominated or nominate themselves, just like Jojo said. And uh, there's also going to be uh, vacancies for the officers. So keep that in back of the mind if you want to help uh, this uh, club progress and help in the direction of this club. It's uh, very much appreciated, everybody. Uh, appreciated to put in a little bit of your, uh, your time and effort to make this a better club the way we all want it to go. So I'm going to 
turn it back to uh, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for those updates. Okay, uh, before we move on to our main topic tonight, does anyone have any other news items or anything else to share? All right, okay. Uh, Chris, we'll hand over to you for our main topic tonight. Uh, good evening, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Chris and 6ICW. I do have some photographs to share. Do I just push the button at the bottom to make that happen? Yeah, that should work. Yep. Let's see. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. That's not the way I see my screen. How about we try that? Okay. Is there an image popped up that everybody can see? That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, lots of buttons. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, tonight's uh, topic is pretty much uh, the repeater uh, system that uh, has been uh, going through a lengthy upgrade and has had some maintenance uh, along the way also that started almost a year ago. Um, some members of the board approached me about uh, what could be improved upon, updated on the repeater system, and it was uh, decided to get a new controller. Our, uh, Existing one that we've been using, a CAT 300, was purchased in the early 2000s, has been discontinued probably for 10 years. The company went out of business about a year ago. And wow. so we got a new controller and a voting uh, uh, cage, which is the, what you're looking at in that image. And also then Carol brought up the idea of uh, adding All-Star and Echolink. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm in, for that in the early part of the year. So we sort of uh, grabbed equipment from various spots and did a temporary uh, installation into the old controller with uh, Carol donating the bulk of the equipment, a Yaesu FT8800, and the, the node which has been installed at my house, which is close to the West Sacramento hub, about five miles away. So it made it easy to do a RF link over to the repeater hub site that does not have internet. And also through the year, after having just a year ago, just gotten done dealing with a fire or starting to deal with a fire for Mount Vaca for my system and the site that I maintain with five other or four other members or groups that, at that site, um, I've been quite a busy year. <laughs> so anyway, um, for the club, there was a, uh, and maintenance, we've had a preamp go out up on Pine Hill. Uh, we've lost audio paths that were coming out of the hub that had to be diagnosed, but, and repaired. But fortunately with the system having, uh, standalone, uh, standalone mode up on Pine Hill, we were able to switch into that and minimize downtime while that got repaired. Uh, the system has four voting receivers. We've been struggling for the last couple of years of keeping all four of them up and running simultaneously for various reasons. Uh, the last high level receiver that went in a couple of years ago was up in Auburn, but that was on and off the air because of site access and other folks uh, controlling the site, making it difficult to keep that up and running. But we did retrieve that receiver and relocate it up into El Dorado Hills, where it's been working quite well. And uh, it's at a very excellent site that hears quite well because of low noise. And so the receiver hears quite well. Um, I've been being up on Mount Vaca a lot. I also did a tune up on the Vaca receiver. And just more recently, the hubs two meter receiver is on a temporary antenna. The club has actually purchased a new antenna to go at the hub site to improve the downtown coverage. But I've, we've been depending on the landlord to get up on the tower for the last three months to actually do the install. The antenna and cabling is all at the site in the building waiting for that to happen. But we're on a temporary commercial antenna that's not quite as resonant as the one that's cut for the ham band. So in the upgrades that the board approved, we got this uh, JPS voter that you're looking at. 
made by Raytheon. It's the Cadillac of voting systems, very popular to be used in public safety, uh, like police and fire dispatch, and also uh, the military. Um, it actually has the capability of being hooked up to the network or internet, where if we had uh, network access, we could actually control it and look at statistics of you know, how different receive sites are working, uh, how many times they're keyed up, how many hours and minutes they're actually on the air, daily, weekly. Uh, and if they failed, you also can see if there's an issue going on and know which hilltop may be causing a problem. But we don't have internet yet, but that could be a future addition to the uh, system. As you can see, there are individual cards that go in there, and they're called radio cards. And they basically represent a receiver. So one might be Mount Vaca, Pine Hill, El Dorado Hills, the hub. In also part of this upgrade, I have added an additional UHF receiver to be able to add a fifth receiver uh, into the system where we get a location to put in a uh, additional fill-in coverage. And so the voter is going to be already set up to receive that signal. And so that's been added. We've also added an additional UHF receiver that's a control receiver. Uh, for the system basically giving us a back door for operation of the, of the repeater. I'll go on to the next slide. This is a close-up view of the new controller. It's an RCOM RC210. It's a three-port controller. And as you can see in this uh, picture, they show you, you know, which uh, ports have pushed to talk, COS, PL, and if there's touch tone activity. And also our unit has uh, audio delay boards for uh, all three ports, allowing us to strip out uh, squelched tails and to mute the touch tones so that they don't, aren't heard over the air. And then we added a Bridgecom UHF uh, radio to replace Carol's Yesu for the All-Star Echolink. So this is a point-to-point -point, uh, radio, that, or it's point-to-point -point link running from my house to the, the repeater's hub site to get the all-star audio to and from the repeater system back into the internet. And this runs on a dedicated uh, antenna, has a Yagi aimed towards uh, South Natomas where it's picking up the signal. The node, I think, Carol, you said it runs on a couple hundred milliwatts, but even over four miles, we have a good solid signal for over that distance. This is the actual picture of the installation uh, showing uh, that Russ and I did over this past weekend, uh, where you can see the uh, voter sort of center of the picture, and then I'll zoom in a little bit on that. And then you can actually see the RCOM in action where port one and port two are active. So every time someone's talking on the repeater, port two is the link for All-Star. So that radio is always transmitting back into Echolink All-Star, even if there's not a connection, it's talking back there waiting to uh, con control or command the All-Star node. Uh, right below that is the uh, graphic equalizer that is used to fine tune the audio for the two meter receivers coming out of the voter and then also for the 900 meg uplink. Uh, let's see. These uh, Motorola are the receivers and there's actually now, uh, it's not in this picture, but uh, as I said, two more receivers have been added into the, the mix. Let's see here. There's my arrow. And here's the bottom of the rack with the bridge com. It has its uh, own, uh, that's the UHF link radio. It has its own UHF uh, bandpass cavity. Uh, we haven't done the mounting bracket yet to finalize that. And then the Motorola receiver right above it is the uh, new control receiver. And there's Russ uh, with lots of determination to get that crimp on and just get ready to fire up the new installation of the controller and the, the uh, voter. I believe that's all the photographs I have on the upgrades. I do have some other photographs I can share uh, 
maybe after a Q&A of other repeater sites. Some of them uh, include uh, um, up in Tahoe and also San Francisco. Some of you may have seen them, uh, some of these pictures uh, when I've done a presentation to the club in person four or five years ago. Uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, come on now, don't be bashful. Yeah, how do voters work? Oh, okay. Well, they're not Democrat or Republicans. They don't discriminate. They basically, you have multiple receivers all listening to, um, 14465, the input of the repeater. That's when you're talking on your radio to the repeater, that's the frequency you're transmitting on. So your signal could be hitting multiple locations and they come on a dedicated uh, UHF audio path back to the voter that listens to all of those receivers simultaneously and listens to the best signal to noise ratio and then chooses only one of those. So you may be noisy into one receiver, but you have another receiver that you're full quieting into and that's the one that gets voted. And the voter can be switching between receivers right in mid-sentence, sometimes right in between syllables. But you as the user or listener can't hear that switching back and forth, it's transparent. And so on my repeater system, I have eight receivers scattered from San Francisco, from Grass Valley down to Amador County. So basically the whole valley is surrounded by, think of it as a big set of ears that are always listening. Standard repeater just has a receiver and a transmitter. The voter does the housekeeping of, of managing all those satellite receivers. Does that uh, answer your question? Somewhat. <laughs> well, you know, it's like following an electron around. You don't know where it's going or where it's been, but it sure is cool when it gets the job done. It's and, 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 it's, and it's supposed to be transparent. So you as a user really, Sometimes I'll hear people say, well, I must be coming through this receiver or which receiver am I coming through? Well, unless you're standing right in front of that uh, voter with all the LED lights, I have no way of knowing. Uh, so uh, if we had it hooked up on the internet where I could pull it up on my computer screen, I could tell that you're on the Mount Vaca receiver on that particular transmission. But normally it's supposed to be transparent to the user and uh, but it enhances the sensitivity of the repeater to give a better experience for the users instead of just your the standalone repeater receiver. A lot of the repeaters like up on Mount Diablo and Mount Vaca, they just are a standalone repeater. And if you're hearing the repeater with a little bit of noise, the repeater is probably hearing you with a lot of noise. Where on our system, you could be on a handheld and you're full quieting because you're close to some receiver because we have these satellite receivers and the voter, as I said, just does the housekeeping for that. Wow, impressive. And it's all computerized. Each of those radio cards has a microprocessor in there and it's doing a digital uh, conversion of the uh, analog audio to basically do number crunching to decide what receiver is better than the other? So it's a pretty clever uh, technology. And then we can also control it. We have ways to disable those receivers. So if a receiver was receiving interference, whether uh, intentional or unintentional, we can remotely shut off that receiver for the moment. It's still transmitting on the UHF link. We just don't listen to it. <laughs> and by having the redundant receivers also it makes it easier for me doing maintenance because if one of them goes off the air, eh, okay, we lost a little bit of performance, but we're still uh, on the air. Okay. The uh, controller, um, having the three ports makes it a lot easier to add other inputs to the repeater, in this case, like Echolink and All-Star. And so it tries to make that seamless. They have actually, um, different courtesy tones. So the main repeater has a unique courtesy tone of its own where the Echolink All-Star I think has a two beep or a triple beep. And that's how you can tell which port someone's coming from. Huh. 
So you, if you listen to the, and they call that telemetry. So if you listen to the tones, you actually can learn to go, oh, they're on the repeater. That person's on echo link. Oh, huh, cool. How about, how about the slow scan TV? Does that run through this also? Not on this repeater. Slow scan is on the UHF repeater. That's just a standalone repeater. Okay. I, I, that's just by choice. I've been with the club for quite a while, but this is the first opportunity that I have to listen a little bit about the repeater. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the transmitting site, uh, you know, power and location? And also, uh, is there uh, some uh, map indicating where the, the receivers are? On the website, uh, Carol has done an excellent job putting together uh, the pretty good summary of uh, with block diagram of the repeater system. This is the um, Pine Hill transmitter uh, site. Down at the very bottom of that cabinet is a UHF link. So the, the two meter receiver up there is linked back to West Sacramento to the hub of the system. The Motorola receiver right above that is a 900 meg receiver. And so that's the uplink. So if you had the block diagram off the website, it shows arrows showing signals coming in, signals going out. Right above the, that Motorola is the Kenwood repeater. So that's the transmitter. It only runs about five, 10 watts. Uh, and right above that is a local controller. So normally we call this in link mode because it's listening to the hub, but we can put it in standalone mode where it's just like a standalone repeater, transmitter and receiver. Power supply in the upper middle and then the very top is the Henry power amplifier. It's in the neighborhood of 150 watts, but we go into what's called a transmit combiner. We share with the FBI and... Um, Let's see, uh, uh, another uh, federal government agency, um, fire, uh, the ones that do firearms and, and uh, alcohol. Oh, it? yeah, that bunch. <laughs> that bunch, yeah, okay. The, and, anyway, yeah. there's two federal agencies who are customers at the same building and room that we're in. We both, all three of us share the same antenna and we have these filters to combine our transmitter. So that 150 watts ends up probably being in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 watts at the antenna. And we then run a four bay folded dot hole array for those three re uh, repeater systems. And so our ERP, I think, I don't know if Carol had that calculated out, probably in the neighborhood of 500 watts ERP. Does that answer your transmit question? Oh, absolutely does. And, I'm and, and there are coverage maps on the website. Yeah, I'm going to spend some time on, on the website. Thanks. So the coverage map really only shows the transmit coverage pattern, but I believe it also lists what the locations of the receivers. So the receivers try to sort of be around the transmitter to fill in into the fringe area, not just in the primary coverage area. Thanks very much. Any other questions? Chris, I have a question. Uh, I'm a relative newbie with uh, D-Star, still learning the basics. So what would be involved with adding D-Star at some point uh, to our repeater system? Well, we're pretty much dedicated right now to the All-Star Echolink, which is a, uh, is that a Raspberry Pi, Carol? Yeah, yeah. So it basically can, those, can only do one or the other. I don't think it can uh, cross-link the two services at the same time, can it? Uh, yeah, it uh, will work uh, both All-Star Echolink uh, at the same time. Uh, but but D-Star is a different format, and that's like more on an a, a RF level. And usually you don't mix analog repeaters with digital repeaters. There are some... Uh, equipment out there, Motorola makes a Moto Turbo that you can run their digital format and analog. So if you go in analog, it comes out analog, but if you go in digital, then it's going out digital. And if you're doing the digital, you could be on a network tying other repeater systems together. But um, 
No, I don't see for uh, D star for the club in the near future, unless we're coming up with another radio channel to do that. Getting radio channels is a challenge. Getting radio sites is also a challenge, especially uh, in metropolitan areas. So I think there are some D star systems in the area, but I'm not too sure who's running them. You can go to NARC, uh, which is a frequency coordinator, NARCC.org uh, for Northern California Frequency Coordinator. And they have a complete list of all repeaters and you can sort those by formats. Mm. So even though 90% of them are analog, they have a section for digital and then they break that down into P25, D star, and you can see what D star systems are in your neighborhood. Great, thank you. I have one more question. Uh, we've noticed on the net uh, that uh, sometimes uh, the echo link input, which by the way, I've used and it is fantastic. Uh, it has a noticeable delay. Is there something that's intrinsic on that mode on the interconnection or is something that can be done? Uh, so anytime you're dealing with the internet, there's this thing called latency or delay. And so, the node is sitting on a fiber optic here at my house. So we have high speed internet going to the node. So now you got to consider everything in between to get to you. So how good is your connection and how fast it is. So just like on a cellular phone, the best you're going to see is 50 to 100 milliseconds delay, a little bit of an echo if you were full duplexing with yourself or listening to yourself at real time. Um, depending on the network connection that can be extended out. And as you say, you get that longer delay. It is a bit of a challenge, especially when you got people on the two meter repeater who are fast on their push to talk, not allowing the person on the echo link to come back in at the same time. Russ and I still have some programming to do on the controller. And I think there is a way I've been suggesting to him that we program it up where we do audio mixing. So even if I, someone continue to talk on the two meter repeater and you coming in on echo link, everybody else listening at least knows that you're doubling instead of uh, two meters dominating and just stepping on you. And we don't even know you're talking. So it's uh, in fact, if you got good ears and you can listen to two people talking simultaneously, you can make out what the, the, uh, the other person said. So I do that on my repeater. I have it audio mixed. And so that way, if someone is too fast on their push to talk, other people can will notice that, let them know, slow up a little bit, give the person on Echo like a chance to get back in to respond. Yeah, I think that's why our net control has been saving all the all-star and Echo Link check-ins for the uh, tail of our uh, check-ins so that they don't have, they're not competing with the latency. And uh, so it does make for a much cleaner check-in anyway. It's one way to manage it if it's that kind of thing, but if it's an uh, back and forth conversation, it gets a little scrambled if you're not being gentlemanly. Oh, it can be a challenge. I used to uh, link my 147.195 on IRLP to a reflector with two other repeaters in Texas. So we actually had a network of repeaters and you, you could get that, uh, people stepping on each other, but we had good speed, uh, high speed connections between the sites and uh, the guys uh, learned to provide a, a little bit of lag time on that. Uh, and, and that's another thing we, uh, Russ and I need to look at on the programming. We can push the, possibly push the courtesy tone out a little bit. So you unkey, uh, you may not get the courtesy tone right away. We could say, make it wait for a quarter of a second. Then there's the courtesy tone giving the person on Echo Link a better chance to being heard and getting back before the next person keys up on two meters and steps on them. But we had to look at the fine tuning of the programming to see if we can uh, tweak that a little bit, but it depends on users pausing and waiting for courtesy tones. If they're stepping on the courtesy tone, they're gonna time out the repeater and, and cause havoc anyway. So it, it's, there's a, a user issue to, you know, try to make that work well. But you're right on the net, it does help that uh, net control just sets a time aside for the people checking in from that uh, port of the system. 
I do, uh, if we don't have any other questions, I do have some other photographs. Actually, this is the antenna system for the, uh, uh, I think it was Neil that was asking about the uh, transmit antenna. This is Pine Hill and the bottom right-hand side are the four bay antennas and they're all facing towards Sacramento. So it actually gives a nine dB gain lobe towards Sacramento. So that's why we were able to get five, 600 watts ERP effective radiated power going towards the valley floor, giving a nice strong signal. Quite impressive. Oh, you got to come in here and harass me. Excuse me, I got a cat that's invading me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I also wanted to comment, if anybody has any questions about the use of the All-Star on the Echo Link, uh, it is, um, it was one of our programs back in uh, February of this year. And you go to our website and list the meeting programs, you'll be able to pull up the, uh, the YouTube uh, video of the February meeting. And, and that'll, that'll be the entire introduction to uh, how we added All Star and Echo Link to our web, uh, to our um, repeater, and uh, how to operate it as well. And there's a demonstration there in that video as well. And uh, for the question of DMR, uh, DMR is going to be the subject of uh, the presentation at our uh, uh, meeting next month. So uh, just stay tuned and uh, join us for that meeting to learn more about DMR. Should I go through a few more slides here? Sure. <laughs> um, this is actually... Uh, Pine Hill also, this is a, a state of California's uh, radio vault. There is a cabinet buried in this room that uh, has ham equipment in it. And in fact, there's uh, uh, four voting receivers in there for uh, El Dorado Amateur Radio Club, 146.805, 147.195, my system, uh, and North Hills. Uh, sharing the same and receive antenna that the River City Arcs does in the other building that's located down there. This uh, vault contains microwave links, uh, CHP, Dep uh, Department of Transportation, Forest Service is in there. And wow. so they have a ton of stuff crammed in there. Um, this is actually a, a, the racks belong to El Dorado County. So they're uh, Sheriff's Department has voting systems and their main transmitter for uh, is up on Pine Hill and they have two channels and I think there's some uh, MedNet channels and other uh, radios that uh, is part of the El Dorado County's uh, stuff. They're in that same room. And then these are the battery backups that they run for their microwave. There's other battery backups for other equipment in that room. It's uh, well engineered fully documented, uh, quite elaborate. Uh, the hams have been in there since the, this building went in back in the early 2000s. And those are very tall bandpass cavities. Those are the ones being used for the CHP because they're down around 45 megacycles, 47 megacycles. So those things are seven feet tall to be resonated at 47 megacycles where wow. The, the ones that are uh, those little grayish ones are smaller. Those are VHF, half the size versus the uh, ones in the uh, 45, 47 megs. Uh, this is a Sutro Tower in San Francisco. It sits up above uh, Twin Peaks. I happen to have a receiver, voting receiver for my two meter repeater that's located in a cabinet up on what's called the 300 foot level. And that's a, almost a thousand feet to the very top and almost 2000 feet above sea level. So from that location, you're actually looking over downtown Golden Gate and the Pacific Ocean. And as you, you can see in the middle here, this is actually a catwalk that's fully enclosed with cabinets inside. And then the antennas are on top and below. And believe it or not, they actually have full-time staff that climbs around that tower, goes outside and goes up on the top to mount these antennas. 
In fact, as a business, every antenna position is permitted with the city of San Francisco. And we're there. <laughs> I have on my re repeater system, 147.195, I have a receiver there. So I have, I'm on a master receive antenna for VHF shared with the San Francisco Amateur Radio Club on 145.15. Then I have a UHF Yagi aimed towards Mount Vaca uh, by uh, Vacaville that shoots a signal to Vacaville and then does a second UHF hop to the hub of my system in Alberta. So it's a double UHF hop. I can't make Alberta line of sight from that location. So this is up on the tower, looking out one of the little port windows at the 300 foot level. And that wire rope that you see in front of you, that, that's part of the stabilized guy wires. And if you can sort of look down at the bottom of the screen, you see there's little, there are actually houses down there, but the fog is in in that particular image. This is looking up and you can actually see the fog going up towards the top of the tower. And this is a tower where the major broadcasters in San Francisco, KGO, KPIX, uh, some FM radio station, of course, all the public safety law enforcement, they're all up there. So wow. this is looking up the tower towards the sky. This is a, a different day, but these are tons of microwave dishes and antennas and uh, then uh, the guy wires to stabilize this thing. Actually, this is freestanding. These are stabilizing wires. They're really not guy wires. Okay. Just like tensioning. Yeah, to keep it from swaying. So this is actually the VHF antenna that I was talking about that we share along with my UHF Yagi right below that. That has changed a little bit. My Yagi is still there. We now switch to an antenna that's 400 feet higher up. And there's a preamp up there back feeding the signal down, giving us better performance. And the landlord provided that. So I said, oh, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> So this is a view of the Golden Gate. And so we're looking towards Marin, Val uh, Marin County across the bay. The Golden Gate Bridge would be right in there. Let's see. Yep. There you can see it. Wow. So Chris, and the then, crew that works in that tower full time, you said, but what's the, the risk for RF exposure? Like, do they turn things off when they're working in the tower or is everything? Oh, the there, there is a huge elaborate uh, procedure. They actually have auxiliary antennas. The big concern is the broadcasters. So they actually right. have uh, warning lights that flash red to indicate that when if uh, guys had to go at the very top to go work where the high power stuff is, the engineers from the different radio or TV stations have to come to the site and then switch over to the auxiliary antenna, which is down lower. Right. So there's an elevator that goes up to get up there. And so you go up so far and you have to stop. Then they switch one transmitter off, turn on another one. Now you have a transmitter below you, making it safe for you to travel up to work in the area for the number of hours that you have to be up there. So wow. there's definitely safety procedures. They also, for many decades, have done uh, exposure studies into the residential neighborhood down below. Now, in more recent times, in the last 10 years, everything going UHF digital TV, they've abandoned pretty much all the VHF frequencies. And those were the more concerned ones. The so UHF pretty much shoots over top of the neighborhood mm. and is not really providing any... Uh, concern of an exposure. Uh, in this picture is, of course, downtown San Francisco right there. And you can see the Bay Bridge and tre uh, Treasure Island going towards Oakland. And then close in, this is up by Twin Peaks. This is, this is a reservoir, but also down here in the left center that you can't see is a reservoir that's covered. They've done that more recently to minimize evaporation of the water. But having the reservoirs up at the highest point in the city gives the water pressure to feed their like fire hydrants and whatever else they're 
uh, providing water to out, out of those reservoirs. And off to the right, there are some uh, other radio sites that are down on Twin Peaks, but they're below us in, in this image. That's actually the little radio package of voting receiver I have. So a VHF receiver and a UHF transmitter. Everything has to be filtered. Uh, this is actually looking up or down one of the legs of the tower. And you can see uh, transmission lines and power coming up there. They actually bring up 440 volts, three phase up to that level and then have step-down transformers and circuit breaker boxes just for that level to get power to the equipment. They also have fiber optic fed up there for network stuff for those who need fiber. So this is looking up the, the leg going up towards the top and you'll see these round pipes. Those are transmission lines. They're four inch diameter, 20 foot sections uh, filled with nitrogen and running the TV transmitters through that to get up to the antennas at the top. And they run transmit combiners for the TV stations, just like we were doing for the uh, VHF repeater I was talking about. So that's a uh, common procedure where you got 10 transmitters, but you really only got room for three antennas. You combine them and they have rooms just filled with filters to make that all work. So this is the cow and you can see these cabinets, this is an unprotected space. So consequently, unprotected meaning from the weather. When the fog rolls in, the fog and dampness is rolling right through these. These are weatherproof cabinets. They're all grounded and bonded with surge protectors. Uh, they all have their own dedicated electric service or circuit going to each cabinet. Uh, and they're airtight sealed. So they got rubber gaskets on the door to to keep the dampness from getting inside the cabinet. Off to the left side is a cable tray, so they're running cables horizontal. Wow. This is the elevator that you had to bring up all your equipment in and your tools, and you can only hold two people in there, and it creaks as you go up. And the legs don't, aren't straight up, they're at a diagonal, so you're sort of leaning sideways. And it has a two-way radio in it. Um, in case the thing fails, you can call for help downstairs. <laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> this is actually a diagram. This is actually uh, probably about 10 years old breakdown of the different TV and radio stations elevations. And as I said, this has all now been fully transitioned over to digital television. This uh, was taken when there was still some uh, analog uh, VHF stuff. And wow. so you can see, and, that, and that's just one small diagram, and, and including the, they have a compass showing the three legs to get your bearings so you know which level and which direction you're looking at. So everybody's on the same page. So the site elevation is 834 feet above sea level. And as I said, it's 977 feet to the top. It may actually be a little higher because they've changed some of these upper antennas around and uh, they may be taller. Wow. Where are the ham repeaters located on their, their antennas? So we're on level three at the 382 foot level for our, our cabinet. The 145.15 group uh, has their transmit antenna right above our heads. But the receive antenna is up here on a level level five at 657 feet. So wow. that's where the receive antenna is. And then there's cabling coming down the leg. There's a preamp that we have so that we amplify the signal and, and blast it down the 300 feet of cabling to overcome the losses. And we have a filter window in front of that preamp to protect the preamp from uh, all the other RF up there. So it hears a whisper up there. In fact, if on my repeater, if you're over on the, uh, the beach on the west side of, of San Francisco, you're full quieting into the repeater, but you can barely hear the repeater because Twin Peaks is shadowing Mount Vaca. So I, I got coverage out into the Pacific Ocean, but I don't have transmit signal out there. So 
but it covers in the Bay Area quite well, and it looks over to Oakland. I've had people over at the Oakland A's game checking in with handhelds from across the Bay hitting that antenna. Pretty good. And there's a night view of the tower. I just gonna, I was thinking when you're talking about the height, they've got to have that lit like a Christmas tree. Oh yeah. <laughs> Beautiful picture of Orion, too. Yeah, I just looking at that. <laughs> oh, was there? You took it in winter. <laughs> yep, it's Orion. Yeah. Right in the middle. You can see the belt, uh, the three stars. I can see yep. the uh, three stars uh, the, of the belt. Is that the big dipper or the small dipper upside Orion. down right there? <laughs> that's Orion the Hunter. Oh, that's Orion. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah, that's in the southern sky. The dipper's up overhead more. Cool. Then I got a few more pictures. This is up in Tahoe. This is uh, where the 147.24 repeater is. I was up there helping them run some cabling. Paul WA6EWV, the president of the Tahoe Amateur Radio Club, maintains that system. This is, is a ski hut up at Heavenly Valley, um, just below 10,000 feet. But as you can see, there's no tower there. The tower is up on the left side of the hill here, 400 feet up the side of the hill, and they have all this cabling going up. And we had to run almost 500 feet of the, a brand new run of seven eighths inch hard line. We had a bad run. And um, we have uh, the, in this conduits are a bunch of cables or hard line cables going through there because they have snow cats going through there. They have the, the cabling protected right there, but that's the, the 60 foot freestanding tower sitting right at 10,000 feet. And in the winter time, there's no snow up there because the wind's so strong, it just blows all the snow away. It's that brutal. But here's all the cabling. There's about 15 runs of cabling for, for over 400 feet going up the side of the hill, just laying on the ground. Probably it's an environmentalist nightmare, but it's been there for decades. And including the Nevada Highway Patrol, ham stuff, uh, the Heavenly Valley Zone, ski resorts, uh, repeaters. Wow. And there's a wintertime shot of that. Oh, it's protected by snow. <laughs> well, really, there's no snow right up on the very top there. It just doesn't. Yeah, it just the cables though, are protected by snow. It looks oh, like. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, right. <laughs> This is over on Mount Rose on the north side between Carson City and uh, Incline Village. This is an old AT&T microwave site. The weather's so bad up there that they actually have four by fours strapped to the station, man, uh, station master antennas to keep them from blowing away. Wow. Up uh, there is uh, a bunch of Reno Carson City repeaters. Uh, this is actually a six meter beam. The owner of that site is a ham and he likes to go up there and, and do six meter DXing and contesting. And he also is a big uh, fan of uh, HF contesting and runs remote station up there. <laughs> and there's a UHF repeater up there that uh, a friend of mine down here in Sacramento maintains up there. But these old microwave dishes from at t this was built back in the 50s. They haven't been operational, but these newer round microwave dishes are state of California, Nevada, are using this site, including uh, public safety and Truckee, like uh, Truckee PD gets their internet through this microwave uh, link out of here. Huh. And this is a close up of the rotor of that uh, six meter beam. And then up there at 10,000 feet, there are little critters who come and join us. <laughs> Cute little goober. And there's uh, the old equipment I had up at Mount Vaca for my two meter transmitter for 147.195 that I'm leaning on. That got replaced right after the fire and there's a new system in there. And sometimes it gets muddy where you're going. No fooling. <laughs> Actually, I was foolish on that. I got back there and didn't realize my wheel wells were caked with, and then I, I sliced up one of the rear tires from the mud. So that, oh, got hard enough to poke a hole? 
well, it, it was rubbing against the sidewall, the tire as I was driving and I was hearing noise and didn't tra track it, but the mud was just caked up into the wheel well, right up against the, the wheel. <laughs> so anyway, that's the end of the uh, slideshow. I was certainly couldn't get a ticket because they couldn't read your license plate yet. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> quite impressive. A any you. other questions? Well, I'm sure I overwhelmed you, but I, I'm I, hopefully uh, you you got your money's worth because you've been dishing out a bunch of it for for the equipment, and I think we probably still have a final bill on some of the minor little nickel and dime stuff that has to be added in. I think you guys bought uh, Russia, uh, uh, Russ and I lunch on Saturday when we were out at the site for about eight, six hours. So. Yeah. One of the things I think that you make me aware of, and I'm sure other people there, is that there's an awful lot to know about all those places and all of those things. And it would be lovely if more of us knew more about it so that either A, we could help you, or B, uh, cover a problem whenever you couldn't, you know, because there's only one of you. Uh, how do we go about, you know, learning more about this sort of thing, the repeaters and and our systems in particular? Well, um, I mean, Russ is uh, actually taking care of the uh, control point as far as the programming of the controller. In fact, I actually told him uh, when we were make, starting this project that uh, each controller, just like any kind of computers, have their idiosyncrasies. And I have my own system using a different manufacturer. And in fact, I got a th three inch, uh, a three ring binder down here that's about this thick that is about 200 pages of documentation on how to program my controller and it's overwhelming if you don't do it day in and day out it's sort of like you're back going back and forth from chapter five to chapter seven to try to understand how to make something oh, work so i told like russ <laughs> you, you can, i'll help you put this controller in and set it up but you got to program it and you're going to be the one, who, and he runs the day-to-day -day operation of, of of the system. So, so that's that's kind of the skinny, is that we need you need um, uh, to be a mentor to some uh, people who are willing to just literally shadow your efforts and learn about the various pieces of equipment until you have somebody to take over whenever you decide you can't or you can't. Whatever happens, uh, you've been talking to Phil. Phil got me on the phone over the weekend and. I, I, I was going to start the my, Bill. It just, it just, yeah. I, I just. I, I was going to start the meeting off saying, the rumors of my demise are over exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope you're not going anywhere. But that's an awful lot of equipment to maintain yourself, and it's an awful well, lot. Of well, the moderate. Well, so two things, and 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 the hobby, or not the hobby, but repeaters have evolved tremendously from the 1960s and the 1970s. So as a simple example, even for the River City Arcs and North Hills, you actually had repeater committees, in some cases, eight to 10 people involved because the complexity of the systems. Nowadays, things have actually gotten modulized. And with now one person's maintaining you know, four different systems. I have five repeaters that are interlinked on my whole network of stuff because the equipment so the club has been investing in newer equipment that's very dependable it's modulized we built some redundancy into it so from a maintenance perspective it's sort of like you know your car if you take care of it and do the oil changes and the tire changes and don't wait for things to break it keeps on chugging along so cars back in the 60s you were happy to get 60 80 100 thousand miles out of them before they went to the junkyard now Toyota, you feel robbed if you don't get two hundred thousand miles out of it. <laughs> so yeah, you know, and it's the technology has advanced like that. And okay. also, we some of these radio sites because we've gone in with these other groups where we're using you know, first class operation, the best antennas, the best cabling. Uh, we're doing the best engineering practices. And so consequently, we have a lot of dependability on that. Yeah, okay. so, um, and also the systems are more complex. Uh, so consequently, yeah, and they're piecemeal. 
So this isn't something you couldn't go and replace this repeater just by going to HRO and saying, I want to duplicate this repeater because it's mixed and matched of different manufacturers and parts and uh, yeah, by a sort of a design. So you, you have a basic repeater up on Pine Hill at the Kenwood. They're easy to replace. You can pull them out and even send them in to be repaired. Uh, so, in fact, uh, Russ and a couple of other club members know how to have access to, to Pine Hill, which is the, the main site. Uh, that you guys have the uh, contact to the landlord in West Sacramento because we pay rent to him. And you send him a check once a year for the rent. Okay, and so <laughs> even though I'm the only one with the uh, key, that's sort of unusual because the landlord doesn't want to give out a bunch of keys. He trusts oh, me. Yeah. So I have the key. I may hand it off to one person and say, you know, you, here you can go in there and do whatever you have to and come give me the key back and the landlord's accepting of that. And it's a card key. We can't duplicate. Okay. Uh, so it used to be repeater sites. Oh yeah, go up there. And then this guy goes, makes five copies of the key and he's passing it out all to his buddies. And the next thing, and some repeater groups have gotten in trouble at commercial sites because they let their friends go up there. And all of a sudden the kids are in there twisting on knobs and a commercial repeater is actually going uh, yeah. off, off frequency or not performing correctly and they have a service call and why did this happen well somebody was playing with the equipment they shouldn't have been because they didn't know what they were doing or they weren't paying attention to their kid in this case i rarely have hurt. ever taken people up to a repeater site as a party or a picnic yeah we're going there to work the only thing i had to say i'd like about and why I, I've sort of been intrigued about this is access to these beautiful mountaintops and views and uh, having opportunity to get behind gates where a lot of folks don't get a chance to do that. And so. Makes you really appreciate the commercial side of it for sure. Cause you've seen just how much work goes into it. I, I guess, or whoever does one of their uh, megathons <laughs> and you realize what they're paying for to get over the air it uh, makes an appreciator out of you I, I went to a radio site a week and a half ago with a friend of mine who has medical issues he's in his 70s and he was going up to mount huff that just got burned over from the dixie fire oh and out of quincy and yeah. I, I told dennis i said you shouldn't be going up there by yourself so i went up there with him and we're up at 7500 feet and there's even temporary repeaters from the Forest Service still up there. And there were all those heavy equipment. I mean, it looked like a moonscape up there because the fire had just gone through there only two or three weeks earlier. The building was saved and the, uh, no destruction whatsoever to the antennas and everything, but it burnt within 150 feet of the building. But the Forest Service knew it was a critical communication site and they predicted it. And so, but, you know, we went up there and I, I helped my friend out and it was like nine miles of dirt road and dust banging up that road out of Quincy to get there. <laughs> wow. So. Makes you an appreciator. Oh, yeah. not alone from my door to, to up there it was over three hours in one direction. So I was yeah. on the road close to six hours just to go spend two and a half hours up there. It was a Looking long day. <laughs> yeah. So, but I had to help my friend out and I felt it was, you know, he needed to have somebody there in case, you know, he, he had a problem or anything. Yeah, like all things like that, technical, well, people have, that have worked in jobs, technical, it's always been a rule not to be alone in a building. You never know what can happen. So well, uh, the next three days itself. I'm going to Mount Vacta and my wife is stepping up to the plate to go up there with me because I can't find anybody else to go there just to put a silicone membrane roof on that got burned off. So I already got the underlayment on, but now I have to put this final coat on it. It's five gallon bucket of this Henry stuff and you roll it on. Well, oh, I'm like going the, up there tomorrow like to put the roof? first coat up there. And my wife, I said, can you come up there with me? I don't want to be up there by myself. Exactly. So, it's part of safety first, safety first, safety yeah. first. So. Of course, I, she says I owe her big time for this <laughs> christmas is coming <laughs> that's right 
at least a, a nice dinner. I think there's a yogurt shop in Vacaville she likes. So we go there on the way back down the hill. She gets her. Yeah, make food. it worth her while. Her yogurt. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Well, we I think we've jawed enough, but uh, I suppose there's other people have things they might want to throw in here. Anyone have any other questions for Chris? Uh, I'd like to give a comment and also an appreciation because when I traveled to San Francisco uh, one night during the San Francisco Marathon, I was stuck in traffic in the Car Carnegie's Bridge and I only had my uh, uh, handy talkie, but I had N6 ICW repeater uh, programmed. So from inside the car, I tried calling CQ somebody from San Jose picked up my call and responded to me. So I would personally vouch that if you have a handy talkie or any uh, radio for that matter, make sure you program N6 ICW and you'll, you'll get uh, the coverage uh, that you need or maybe the help. There he, was a he, he's biased, don't listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And uh, I was really convinced that people like Chris uh, really need help in what he does for the whole Sacramento Valley, Tahoe, and San Francisco. So that was my pleasure to, to help you out. Are, guys. You are appreciated. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very Sometimes much. there's nothing wrong with being positively biased. <laughs> yes, for sure. So. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time, Chris, to prevent, uh, present for us tonight. And we appreciate everything you do for the club and the whole community in general, because you know, without you, we wouldn't have all these facilities. So yeah, we, we thank you for your hard work that you do for us. Well, yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure. I enjoy it. It's my pastime. I could be doing something else like hanging out at a bar. <laughs> right. <laughs> Keeping out of trouble. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining tonight. Have a good evening and we'll see you again next month. Thank okay. you. All right. Thanks everyone. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone. Great meeting. Yes.